It takes 21 days to lock in a habit, 10,000 hours to master anything, and motivation is the key to your success. Well, you're gonna learn why all of these statements are false in today's Acoustic Tuesday show. Hey, TAC family, Tony Policastro here, but today you can call me Rudolph. Welcome to episode 176 of the Acoustic Tuesday show. This show is designed to bring fun, focus, and progress to your guitar journey through my weekly Guitar Geek list, plus success stories from your fellow TAC members. In fact, today you're gonna meet Guitar Geek TJ from Colorado, who picked up the guitar 20 years ago and didn't play all that much throughout those 20 years. But now he's playing regularly and experiencing a ton of progress progress, doing things that he never thought he would do. You're going to learn about TJ from Colorado here in a moment, plus you're going to get some acoustic guitar news you can use, including some resonator technology that's, well, it's new to me, and it may be new to you as well, some wise words from one of my favorite fingerstyle guitar players, and a bunch more. But first, I want to talk about habit science and how it can impact your guitar journey. So let's go ahead and dig in. I wanna kick this off by going back in time to when my guitar journey first started. And you need to know three things. Number one, I was extremely stubborn. Number two, I had a go big or go home attitude. And number three, if given the choice between easy and hard, generally speaking, I would do things the hard way until I learned the five things I'm gonna share with you today. Yes, the five things I'm gonna share with you today are rooted in behavior and habit science, and they will make an enormous impact on your guitar journey and how you approach the guitar in general. So let's go ahead and dig in. Now, I'll be referencing five different books, and I strongly recommend that you check these books out at your leisure. They contain a wealth of information that has huge implications on your guitar journey, but also just regular life. And I think these books are... Uh, they're on my top recommendations list. Let's just put it that way. They're on my top recommendations list for non-guitar books that will have a huge impact on your guitar journey. That's kind of a weird title, but we're gonna go with it. Uh, now, I wanna dig in here, but I also wanna mention this. The concepts that I'm gonna discuss today, I'm gonna very briefly uh, kind of go through. If you wanna do a deep dive into these concepts and how they truly relate to your guitar journey, there's a workshop at TonyPolacastro.com. That's my name, .com. Go ahead and go there, and there's about a 45-minute web class where I apply these concepts directly to your guitar journey. And I think you'll get a kick out of it, especially if you resonate with any of the information I'm about to share with you. So let's go ahead and dig in. The first uh, habit science, uh, the first habit science concept that I want to discuss is habit formation. The common myth is that it takes 21 days to lock in a habit. That's actually not true at all, and science backs it. BJ Fogg, PhD, and he actually runs the Behavior Science Lab at Stanford, found that it's not an amount of days that locks in a habit, it's emotions that lock in a habit. How something makes you feel makes you more likely to do it again. If you feel good doing something, you're gonna keep doing it. So how do we apply this to our guitar journey? Well, BJ Fogg is the author of Tiny Habits, a book that I strongly, strongly recommend. And habit formation really is the tiniest step you can make to feel good to lock in that thing that you wanna do over and over again. And for us, that's of course guitar playing. Now, there are three steps in creating a habit and you can remember them relatively easy, uh, A, B, C. You have to define an anchor moment, something that you do day in and day out that you don't think about, but you can attach another behavior to. Uh, B is behavior. What's the new behavior you want to do? For us, it's playing guitar, and it has to be tiny, the smallest possible thing. I say play for 10 minutes a day, but if you want to make it even tinier, say play one chord a day. So you have your anchor moment, you have the behavior you want to do, and then your celebration. This is the feel-good thing that locks in your habit. Now, I want to move to a TED Talk by BJ Fogg here that pretty much sums up the tiny habit's impact. Now, he's talking about health here, but if you replace the word health with guitar, I think you'll find that it applies pretty significantly to our guitar journeys. Let's check it out. Now, when we look at health outcomes, bullseye, what do we want to do? Well, things like lose weight, manage stress, and so on. But if you design for the outcomes, you're designing at the wrong place. You need to design for the behaviors that lead to the outcome. And if you take an issue like weight loss, 
there are many, many behaviors that can contribute to that outcome. Stress reduction, eating better, and so on. And I would propose that most of the behaviors that we need to do are habits. So of the 15 ways behaviors can change, the one that matters most to long-term health are habits. And as we create what I call these tiny habits, and we can't do it all at once, little by little, we will then approach this health outcome in a very reliable way, in a way that doesn't regress, in a way that doesn't make you, oh, I give up, now I'm just gonna go back to how I was. The next behavior concept I wanna discuss is that motivation is BS. And Mel Robbins discusses this in her book, Five Minute Rule. This is a fantastic book. It should definitely be on your reading list because it applies to your guitar journey, but it also just applies to life in general. Now, motivation is great when you actually have it, but motivation ebbs and flows. So you need to design your guitar routine so that you can complete your playing session on your most unmotivated day. Hence, making it very small, which is a reference to B.J. Fogg, who we just discussed, and his book, Tiny Habits. See, all these concepts are gonna, all these concepts are gonna start connecting. But the whole notion with motivation is that, as I mentioned, it ebbs and flows. And our brain is actually trying to protect us. We don't wanna do things that make us uncomfortable. In fact, Mel Robbins discusses this with Tom Bilyeu in a great interview on Tom's Impact Theory podcast. Let's check it out. You have these incredible ideas, and what you think is missing is motivation. Mm -hmm. And that's not true. Because the way that our minds are wired, and the fact about human beings, is that we are not designed to do things that are uncomfortable, or scary, or difficult. Mm -hmm. Our brains are designed to protect us from those things, because our brains are trying to keep us alive. And in order to change, in order to build a business, in order to be the best parent, the best spouse, to do all those things that you know you want to do with your life, with your work, with your dreams, you're going to have to do things that are difficult, uncertain, or scary, which sets up this problem for all of us. You're never going to feel like it. Motivation's garbage. You, you only feel motivated to do the things that are easy. Behavior concept number three, identity propels habit. Now, I learned about this through James Clear's book, Atomic Habits, another dandy that needs to be on your reading list. But essentially, what he says is that if you claim the identity of the person you're aspiring to be, then you start doing things that propel your habit. For example, if you're a runner and you claim your identity as a runner and you buy the shoes and you subscribe to the magazine, you start to do the things that runners do on a regular basis. Well, just replace the word runner with guitar player. I want you to own the fact that you're a guitar player. I want you to claim that identity because if you claim that identity, you're gonna do things guitar players do. And that's gonna iron out or rather lock in your habit that much more because your identity is as a guitar player. Now, James Clear says this much more eloquently, and this is taken from another podcast, one that is one of my favorites, the Rich Roll podcast, where he interviewed James Clear. And here's how big of an impact identity actually has. Check it out. Your habits are the way that you embody a particular identity. So every morning that you make your bed, you embody the habits of, uh, you embody the identity of an organized person, someone who's clean. Every time you go to the gym, you embody the identity of someone who is fit. Every time you sit down to write a sentence or a page, uh, you embody the identity of someone who's a writer. And so in that sense, habits are like, every action you take is kind of like a vote for the type of person that you believe that you mm -hmm. are. And as you take these actions, you build up evidence of a particular identity. And pretty soon your beliefs have something to like root themselves in. It's like, man, I, you know, I've showed up at the gym for four days a week for the last three months. I guess like I'm the type of person who doesn't miss workouts. The common figure that so many people lean on is that it takes 10,000 hours to master any given skill. And that's simply not true at all. Because I wanna follow that up with another question. How are you spending those 10,000 hours. If you spend 10,000 hours simply playing the same thing over and over again, you're gonna be really good at that one thing, but you're not gonna be good at anything else. Which brings me to the next book and behavior concept that I wanna discuss. I wanna discuss purposeful playing. And this is, this is talked about at length in Anders Ericsson's book, Peak. 
and he's uh, somebody who studies how the best of the best do what they do. And one of the concepts that he's discovered is purposeful playing or purposeful practice, where you need to identify that edge of comfort. You need to push yourself beyond your current comfort zone because if you do that on a regular basis, you will, without a doubt, experience progress because you're always pushing yourself a little bit beyond where you're comfortable with, a little bit beyond your current skill level. In fact, there's a wonderful video I found that outlines Anders Ericsson's purposeful practice, the four steps to purposeful practice, and here it is. Anders recruited an undergraduate student from Carnegie Mellon University named Steve Falloon to come in to his office multiple times a week for one hour at a time to listen to a string of random digits and repeat them back to him using only his working memory, his short-term memory. Each session, Anders would give Steve a set of digits to recall. If he got that right, he would add a digit. If he got it wrong, he would take off two digits. So he'd go from six to seven to eight. If he got eight wrong, he'd go back to six to seven. So that way he was always operating on the boundary between what he could and couldn't do. And he did this by activating what Anders would later call the four components of purposeful practice. First, he had a well-defined specific goal. His short-term targets were extremely obvious. If he was able to recall 13 digits, he knew his next goal was 14. Second, his practice sessions were intense periods of undistracted focus. For an hour, all he would focus on was trying to remember digits. Third, he received feedback after each attempt. In other words, his feedback was immediate and easy to understand. He either got it right or he didn't. And lastly, he was constantly being pushed outside of his comfort zone by operating just on the edge of his abilities. And he frequently made mistakes. He would move up one, move up another, but then go back two if he failed. So a quick recap before we get into the final behavior concept. Emotion creates habit, courtesy of BJ Fogg, PhD. Motivation is BS, courtesy of Mel Robbins and her book, The Five Minute Rule. Identity is what propels your habit, courtesy of James Clear and his book, Atomic Habits. And then lastly, 10,000 hours to master anything is BS. It's actually how you spend the time. And if you spend it practicing purposefully, courtesy of Anders Ericsson's book, Peak, then you will get progress every single day. Not get progress, you will feel progress every single day. Which brings us to the final concept, and that is positive thinking, realistic positive thinking. And this is courtesy of Gabriel Ottingen and her book, Rethinking Positive Thinking. Everybody says, think positive. It's the, it's the only way to achieve your goals. And yes, I do want you to think positive, but I want you to be realistic and make a backup plan for that positive thinking. It is simply not enough just to think positive. In fact, if you only think positively, you are less likely to achieve your goal and less likely to take action. Whereas, according to Gabriel Ottingen, if you take into account things that will get in your way via her outline or her acronym, WHOOP, you have a wish, you have a desired outcome, you take into account obstacles, and you make a plan around those obstacles, you are much more likely to achieve your goal. Let's take a look and see how WHOOP actually plays out and the science behind it. Here it is. The first step of WHOOP is really letting your mind go with a wish of what you want for the future, and then scaling that wish back to a feasible action that you could take today to move closer to your ultimate vision. If you have a health goal, it could be going for a run after work or eating one serving of vegetables with every meal. Outcome means focusing on the best possible benefit that you expect to experience after completing the intended action. This could be balanced or energized or self-confident. Obstacle means focusing on the biggest internal obstacle you need to overcome today to fulfill your wish. If your action is feasible, then the only thing that can hold you back from doing that action is an internal obstacle. We need to be self-aware of the ways in which we hold ourselves back. This could be debilitating self-doubt, chronic procrastination, or urges to indulge in comfort food. And then finally, plan, meaning focusing on when and where you expect to encounter your internal obstacle by writing out an if-then action plan to deal with that internal obstacle. For example, if I come home tired from work, then I will put on my running shoes and walk outside. So there you have it, five behavior concepts that will impact your guitar journey in a major way. Why? 
because your guitar routine is a habit. And if you leverage these scientific principles to make sure that you feel progress every single day that you play, you're gonna be sitting pretty. Now, as I mentioned, these principles alone by themselves have a huge impact on life in general. However, if you actually apply them to your guitar journey, it's pretty darn incredible. And I think you'll notice that they dovetail right into your guitar routine. But if you wanna find out more on how they specifically dovetail into your guitar routine, again, make sure to go to TonyPolacastro.com. There's a 45 minute web class there that I think you'll really get a kick out of, especially if you dig this kind of stuff, leveraging scientific principles to actually get the most out of the time you spend with your guitar. Don't be stubborn. Don't have this go big or go home attitude. And please, please, please don't take the hard way like I did when I first started. In fact, if I knew about this stuff when I first started, I would have saved myself a ton of time. It took me reading, well, these five books. And if you're wondering about the five books, let me go ahead and recap them right now. And this is an order of, I guess, importance in my mind, uh, or maybe Im impact, the impact that they've had on me. First is BJ Fogg's Tiny Habits. Fantastic book, one that should be at the top of your list. The next is Mel Robbins' Five Minute Rule. Then we have James Clear's Atomic Habits. We have Anders Ericsson's Peak. And then we have Gabrielle Ottingen's Rethinking Positive Thinking. That's if you wanna do a deep dive on any of these concepts, especially if you're a geek like me, I think you'll really dig them. Now, this brings me to a question that I have for you. Of the concepts I discussed today, which one resonates with you the most? Is it the identity thing? Is it making your habit tiny? Is it uh, creating a backup plan for when life inevitably throws you a curveball? Which concept resonated with you? Go ahead and let me know in the comments below and make sure to tell me why as well. Now let's go ahead and shift focus to a member of the Tony's Acoustic Challenge family. This is TJ from Colorado, and he just celebrated his second year at Tony's Acoustic Challenge. Here's the story of his guitar journey thus far. First question, where was I with guitar when I joined? I was almost 20 years past the last time I picked up a guitar to try to learn to play it. And I came here to tack so I could learn enough that I didn't embarrass myself in the local neighborhood jams that my friends had encouraged me to try. I often wonder if they rethought that invitation back then. Question number two, what are three things you can do now that you couldn't do before Tony's Acoustic Challenge? I play at virtual open mics as frequently as I can, so I'm learning a lot of songs. I have no fear of speaking in public, but singing and playing an instrument, that is intimidating. I've also started hosting a virtual open mic. Number two, I'm able to form, play reasonably competently, and move to the B minor chord and progeny in almost all the songs that call for it. I don't skip it and pretend it really isn't needed, and it was just put there to show me up for my lack of competence. And lastly, I have good virtual friends who regularly under-criticize my guitar playing. Before TAC, no one under-criticized my play. <laughs> and, the third, and the third question here, complete this statement. It would be amazing if this time next year, I can, one, say I actually attempted and then posted one or more of the improvs that happen every Wednesday, Two, be able to finger pick most of the songs I am learning and be willing to post it or do it at a virtual open mic or a live open mic when they return. Number three, be able to determine the key for a song by ear so I can play along without a chord sheet or tab. And number four, have posted the 12 or more Woody Guthrie songs I pledged to learn in 2021. So fellow taxers can review and assist me in my growth. I have two down so far, way over yonder in a minor key and I ain't got no home. Lastly, I wanna say this. This journey is only expanding. Tack is like the universe. The more you see and do, the more there is to find and learn. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, TJ, for not only being an awesome guitar geek, but sharing your guitar journey and your intentions going forward. Congratulations on your two years at Tony's Acoustic Challenge. I only see greater things for your guitar future. It's so cool to see you at the virtual open mics and really kind of pushing yourself outside your comfort zone as we discussed earlier in today's show. How cool is that? I didn't even plan for that. But TJ's continually pushing himself out of his comfort zone and obviously reaping the benefits of progress, just like Anders Ericsson wrote about in his book. It's one of those moments where all the things connect. Okay, let's move on to a guitar snow from one of our very own Acoustic Tuesday viewers. This is Mike Augenstein from Reno, Nevada. And here's what's in his guitar snow. On the couch, left to right, an Emerald X10, an Ovation T-Series, 
Luthier Randy Allen Jumbo, a Takamini GJ72CE 12 string, a gold tone beard square neck resonator, and I'm holding the one that really started it all. And this story is so cool, you gotta check this out. This is a 1971 Martin D28. I bought this guitar used in 1972 as a teenager with lots of odd jobs, paper routes, etc., to get it out of layaway. It's been with me ever since. Even took it on my tour on a submarine in the Navy. The guitar is on its third set of tuners, Grover Goldwings this time, two neck resets, its third pickguard, and second set of frets. To say I wrote it like I stole it would be an understatement. It has been a constant companion, therapist, and wingman for a very long time. Mike, Thank you so much for sharing your guitar snow and also that incredible story that really does underscore how important guitars are to, well, our guitar journey, but just our life journey in general. And I think you summed it up right there, just saying it's been a constant companion, a therapist, and a wingman. So cool, and I can't thank you enough for sharing your guitar snow. Now, if you're sitting there thinking, hey, one of my guitars means a lot to me and I wanna share my guitar snow on the Acoustic Tuesday show, just like Mike did. Well, all you have to do is follow three simple steps. Step number one, go to AcousticTuesday.store and pick out your favorite guitar snow shirt. Number two, once that shirt arrives, put it on and take a picture amongst all of your guitars, just like Mike did. And then lastly, please go to AcousticLife.tv and submit your picture. Click on the submit link in the top menu. Once you're there, you can upload your picture and tell your story just like Mike did. All right, let's press rewind on the VCR and go back to episode 174 of the Acoustic Tuesday show where we talked about guitar tonal experiments. If you haven't checked out that episode yet, please do so. It was riddled with lots of cool guitar experiments you can do from the comfort of your own home. Plus, there was tons of awesome comments left. So let's go ahead and check some of those out right now. Our first comment comes from Acoustic Tuesday viewer, frequent Acoustic Tuesday viewer and awesome songwriter, Jess Jones, and he says this, speaking of hand pain, Tony, I remember you mentioning pain in your fretting thumb. I suffer the same pain from a car door as a kid. Aside from stretching, what works for you? Thinner necks, thicker? Well, as you, as you mentioned, Jess, stretching is my number one. I have to stretch before I play. If I don't, it catches up on me and my hand starts to hurt again, mainly my fretting hand and, as you mentioned, mainly my thumb. But interestingly enough, what I find that works best for me, and this is just personal opinion, is a thicker neck. Now you'd think, oh, if you have hand pain, a thinner neck. I find thinner necks more pinchy for my fretting hand, and I find thicker necks to actually allow me to have more leverage on bar chords. So I point to my uh, Martin OM28 Marquee, which has a modified V neck. It actually has a pretty distinct V that gives me leverage that actually allows my fretting hand to work less hard. I know it seems counterintuitive, but that's what works for me, so I figured I wanted to share it with you in hopes that it would help you as well and anybody else having hand pain for that matter. Our next comment comes from the screen name, Inspirational Pop-Ups with Lisa Vigour. Hopefully I said that last name right. So this comment comes from Lisa. She says this, hey, great inspiration video. Any chance of a link to the website to get the Koto converter? Now she's referring to the Passerelle Bridge and you can get it in one of two places. You can go to Khaki King's website, K-A-K-I-K-I-N-G.com. And I just went there this morning and it seems to be sold out. Uh, so there's another place you can find it and it's by the luthier that actually designed it. And I, I hope I'm gonna say this name correctly. I think it's At Atelier. Rosencrantz. I'll link to the website uh, down below so you can check that out. But to the best of my knowledge, it is available there. And uh, the price looks like it dropped to $65. Now that's at the time of me recording this. Please don't quote me on that price. Make sure to check out the website to get a definitive uh, price on that particular um, Passerelle Bridge. What a cool invention and what a great way to kind of look completely differently at your acoustic guitar. So make sure to check that out. 
Our next comment comes from Jonathan Meyer, and he says this, Another great show today, Tony. What got me out of my rut isn't exactly a tonal experiment, but it was a luthier experiment. And it was learning to build and play the humble cigar box guitar. Shortly after building my first few CBGs, I found the Acoustic Tuesday show and always had it playing in the background while building. Anyway, not only have I learned some guitar maintenance tricks and basics, but I also learned to play slide, open tunings, and the challenge of having only three strings. Makes each note an important one. So if you're in a rut, want to learn a new technique, and get a new one-of-a-kind instrument, I can't recommend building a cigar box guitar enough. What an awesome tonal experiment. And this is one that, Jonathan, I'm so glad you brought up and shared with, with our wonderful Guitar Geek community here, is sometimes it's okay to take a detour, knowing that it's a temporary detour, knowing that you know, you're gonna come back to guitar, of course. So it's not a distraction, it's simply a detour so that you can get another look at a different instrument and then actually take the things you learned from another instrument and apply them to the guitar. Which actually brings me to an upcoming episode of Acoustic Tuesday. We're gonna talk about 10 different instruments that influence the way you play guitar and the lessons that you learn. So Jonathan, I think we're on the same wavelength. Uh, thank you for, re for, I was gonna say reading that comment. Thank you for leaving that comment on the Acoustic Tuesday show. Our next comment comes from Alan Jones, and he says this, great show. The other tone change to consider is the use of wooden picks, especially the heavy gauge picks. They create a great sound. Tack has been very good to me. Well, thank you for being a Tony's Acoustic Challenge member, Alan, and thank you for this tonal tweak recommendation. Yes, pick material, can have a huge impact on how your guitar sounds. And this is funny because I posted the same question on Instagram. By the way, if you're not following Tony's Acoustic Challenge on Instagram, please do so. It's just uh, tac, T-A-C dot guitar. And uh, I posted this question about tonal experiments. And Alan, I'm, I'm happy to say that you and uh, guitarist Eric Sky are on the same wavelength because Eric commented, he said, the best tonal experiment I've ever done is pick material and pick bevel because it has a huge impact on how your, how your guitar sounds. So Alan, you're dead on. Those wooden picks give a, a nice kind of warm tone to the guitar, so they are very worthy of an experiment and just a, a small investment. I don't think those wooden picks are any more than, than 20 bucks. So if you compare them to like a blue chip, pick, blue chip pick, they're about half the price, which is still steep for a pick, but pretty inexpensive when it comes to a tonal experiment. Our final comment comes from Michael Laverty, and this is in regard to an artist that I featured on Acoustic Tuesday episode 174, John Gom. He has so many things coming out. A new signature Ibanez guitar, a new signature Black Star Sonnet amp, and a new album, all of which you, you absolutely must check out. John is a, kind of a guitar hero of mine and uh, just an incredible singer, songwriter, and guitar player. He's a, he's a triple threat for sure. And Michael says this, John Gom seems like an interesting character. I'm gonna check him out. Always find a new artist through this show. Thanks, Tony. Uh, you're welcome, Michael, and John Gom is an interesting character. He's he's definitely, you know, what I gather, you know, I don't know John at all, although he did submit, um, we asked him some Acoustic Life questions, and this was back, I wanna say like early 100s episodes of the Acoustic Tuesday show. Uh, he, he sent in a video, and if I can dig that up, I'll actually share it with you. In fact, as I'm recording this, I think I have that video. Maybe I'll share it right now. Let's check it out. Hi, this is John Gom. I've been asked to answer three Acoustic Life questions. Um, so my first question I have to answer is, who is an under the radar artist that people should be listening to? Okay, so I would say um, one of my favorite ever artists is called Nick Harper. And he's a, an English singer songwriter. He plays acoustic guitar and he's a, kind of a triple threat. So he's a virtuoso acoustic guitarist. He's uh, an incredible singer with just the most kind of powerful, beautiful voice. And he writes unique, uh, intelligent, just, he just writes beautiful songs. Um, my favorite album is probably Harper Space, which is about 20 years old now. And uh, he's the son of Roy Harper, who's a famous kind of 70s British folk legend who was friends with Led Zeppelin and stuff. Um, okay, out of all of your acoustic guitars, which one is your favorite? So um, this is Wilma. She's very, very old. I've been um, playing Wilma for um, since 
1999 so she, I've had her for a really long time and I bought her second hand um, just from an ad in the back of a guitar magazine and she cost 750 pounds and um, she's <laughs> been with me to every inhabited continent on earth now and we've played many many concerts together I've written I think every song that I play kind of in recent times in modern history um, has been written on on this guitar she really needs to retire to be honest as you can see she's she's not a young lady anymore but she still sounds good you know to play like this okay I'll put it down um, and what's the one piece of gear that has changed your acoustic life just <laughs> Wilma <laughs> Wilma but there's there's others you know the pickups inside here are really important um, but uh, one that's changed my life recently is uh, the new amplifier from Blackstar the British uh, amplifier maker because I actually was lucky enough to be able to help them design this amplifier so it's called the Sonnet um, amp and it's like this completely new way of making amplifiers for acoustic guitars anyway that's the advertisement for that over um, okay so thanks very much for listening to my, my music thanks very much um, to uh, Tony for playing my music and apparently I have to say guitar geeks unite I have to accept that Guitar Geek is probably my strongest identity, so <laughs> I can't deny it. Okay, cheers. So yes, indeed, John Gom is an interesting character, but it, but a true creative and somebody that I greatly admire. So make sure to check out his work. Uh, he's just a, a, an awesome addition to the Guitar Geek community. It is almost time to wrap up the show, but before I do so, I do have some acoustic guitar news you can use. Yes, it's part of my responsibility as a guitar geek to help you stay on the front lines of the acoustic guitar industry when it comes to news, innovation, and just cool things you need to know about. The first piece of news I have for you comes from Beard Guitars out in Maryland in conjunction with the company Hipshot. Hipshot is responsible for a lot of invita invitations, innovations when it comes to developments with tuning machines and, and other kind of mechanical things on the guitar. In fact, I first heard of Hipshot in the bass guitar world, but here they are making waves in the resonator guitar world. And of course, Beard is responsible for literally the best resonator guitars ever made, in my opinion, the best wood-bodied resonator guitars ever made. I have my, I have a huge soft spot in my heart for Mule Resophonic guitars, and I love their steel body round necks, but to me, square necks, wooden body guitars, Beard takes the cake. The best in the world, no doubt. Okay, Beard and Hipshot combined created this, this mechanism called the Hipshot Double Shot. And I have to say this, I was a little skeptical of this until I bit the bullet and got a guitar equipped with a hip shot, double shot. I actually just received it uh, last week. And big shout out to the folks in Texas at Guitar Sanctuary. Uh, they were a pleasure to deal with through the whole guitar buying process. But nonetheless, I got a guitar with a hip shot, double shot, and it allows you to play in two different tunings at the flip of a lever. You gotta check this out. Here's a quick video. Hi, I'm Paul Beard, and today I'd like to show you a product from Hipshot. It's a tailpiece that I have installed on one of Jerry Douglas's Beard guitars. <laughs> The next thing I want to share with you comes from one of my favorite fingerstyle guitarists of all time, Andy McKee. If you don't know him, just look up his song Drifting. Right when YouTube started, Andy McKee posted this song Drifting. It's a percussive modern fingerstyle piece and it got like a gazillion kajillion views very early on in YouTube's history, which was a major deal. And I want to say this, I think Andy McKee is one of the torchbearers of modern fingerstyle guitar. I don't think. 
I, I know he is. Uh, to me, it's Andy, uh, it's Michael Hedges and then Andy McKee. And then everybody kind of grew from that using Andy McKee and of course Michael Hedges as a huge inspiration amongst many other artists. But Andy McKee, I saw on Instagram, posted something that was full of insight and I truly found it inspiring. So I wanna share it with you. Let me go ahead and read his post. Within our current reality of social media and the disconnected nature of things, I often worry about the future of music and art in general. Music in particular, to me, is about expressing a universal human truth, something about joy or something about suffering. I am most often impressed by someone with the courage to write their own music than another cover of a popular tune. Oftentimes these days we consume music in some 60 second clip. We are expecting to be wowed by some superhuman feat that titillates our mind but leaves our heart empty, longing for something more meaningful. I will do my best to give you something worth listening to. I have a few projects coming this year. It's been too long and I apologize for that. Be well, my friends. I have to say this post hit me like a ton of bricks because I had the chance to interview Andy McKee some, I wanna say maybe five years ago. And I could tell from the minute we started the interview, Andy was the type of artist that does truly feel things down to his core. We started talking about touring at that time, touring was still a thing. And he was talking about, you know, trying to manage his touring plus having, you know, young children at home. And he almost got, you know, choked up because he was trying to describe that, you know, going on tour allows him to get things like chocolate milk for his kids. And it was just, it was really sweet. But I, I could tell at that moment that Andy is the type of artist that truly feels things. And I thought, you know, I, I think he summed things up quite well there. So uh, cheers to you, Andy. Uh, we as a Guitar Geek Collective certainly look forward to whatever you have coming out this year. And, and we know for sure that is gonna mean a whole lot. And I just love that he, he had such an eloquent way of putting things in perspective. All right, what do I have next? I just lost myself in the beauty of that post. Uh, the next thing I have for you is an article that I just found from Acoustic Guitar Magazine. And they found, um, <laughs> this is a feature on Mark Stutman, and he is known as the Gibson guy. And this is an incredible story because Mark got into vintage Gibsons when vintage Gibsons weren't really a thing yet, and you could get them at a fairly decent price. Not only was he buying these vintage guitars, he was learning a ton about them, repairing them, restoring them, etc. So make sure to check out that article. I think you'll really, really dig it. Uh, another piece of news for you involves a guitar geek friend of ours, an Acoustic Tuesday friend, an Acoustic Tuesday family member, and a hell of a guitar player at that, but also a hell of an, an a hell of an, and hell of an illustrator. Oh my gosh, that was very difficult for me. That was a difficult mountain for me to climb. A great guitar player and an awesomest illustrator, <laughs> Sean DeBurka. Sean DeBurka, uh, if you don't know about him, look up his music first and foremost, but also know that he is an incredible graphic designer. I'm not going to say illustrator again. I'm just going to say graphic designer. Well, Sean has been busy designing the Walnut Valley poster. Walnut Valley is an incredible acoustic-based festival it's almost a mythical festival. And he's designed the poster for this year's Walnut Valley Festival. And he's done an incredible job. Just look at some of these images. Uh, Sean is just a, he's a top notch dude. And as I mentioned, just an awesome graphic designer. So cheers to you, Sean. Great work on the poster. And, and awesome that you're involved in such an iconic festival. I have one more piece of news for you. Yes, indeed, uh, I, which is good because I'm not speaking very clearly today. I'm mashing words together and creating my own vocabulary, uh, something I'm actually pretty darn good at. But the last piece of news comes from Sarah Watkins. You might know Sarah Watkins from the band I'm With Her, which is Sarah Jarose and Aoife O'Donovan. You might know Sarah Watkins from Nickel Creek. You might know Sarah Watkins as a solo artist. Well, she has a new song out that's gonna be featured, of course, on her new album. She has a new album coming out and she's featured a new song. Whatever order you put those in, that's what I meant. The new song is called Blue Shadows on the Trail and it features none other than Nickel Creek. And it's from her new album that's gonna be coming out March 26th called Under the Pepper Tree. It's gonna be out at New West Records. Yes, you can pre-order it right now. And if you're asking Tony, did you pre-order it? You're darn right I did because I heard of this song, Blue Shadows on the Trail, and I thought to myself, that's an album I'd like to have in my record collection. And if you're looking for a taste, let's go ahead and listen to a little snippet right now. You know pretty soon a big yellow moon will lie the way back to the one Shadows on the trail 
And yes, I'm gonna overuse my pun. On that note, I think it's a great time to wrap up the Acoustic Tuesday show. But before I do so, let me go ahead and give you a sneak peek and let you know what I'm gonna be talking about next week on the show. Next week, we're gonna be talking about other instruments and what they can teach you about guitar. Yes, there's some ones that you might associate with the guitar, but there's other ones that you don't associate at all with the guitar. And each one has a lesson that you can apply to the acoustic guitar. So make sure to tune in next week for the Acoustic Tuesday show. It's gonna be a rather rambunctious and lively discussion. And yes, you can catch the Acoustic Tuesday show every single Tuesday at 10 a.m. here on YouTube. I wanna thank you so much for joining me today. I wanna thank you for being a guitar geek. And remember, your guitar progress, your guitar success, however you define it, is directly related to your guitar routine as we discussed about earlier in today's episode. So please, invest the time in your guitar routine and make sure to have fun every single day that you play. Thank you again for joining me today. Thank you for being a guitar geek. Guitar geeks unite, cheers, and I'll see you next Tuesday on the Acoustic Tuesday Show. Take care.